Robin Kurz here, back for the last installment of my little tour of the new M Flare version 2. And this time, after we took a long, hard look at all the goodness in Final Cut Pro 10, we're going to see how M Flare also integrates brilliantly into Motion 5. Basically, the functionality is near 99% the same in Motion as it is in Final Cut Pro 10. The by far biggest difference is in M Flare's handling within Motion. As with most anything in motion compared to Final Cut Pro, it's all a bit more convoluted too. But that's not a shortcoming of M-Flare, but rather just the way things work in motion and its differing approach to many of the same procedures. So let's take a look at this very simple animation I put together and that I'd like to jazz up a little bit with M-Flare 2. So it's a simple text animation with two point lights that cross over at the end. Pretty unspectacular since one can't really even see the two crossing lights. So that's what I'd like to change. Looking at the project structure in the layers pane, you'll see I have a camera, then a group lighting, which holds the various directional lights I'm using for the general lighting of the scene, which you can also see bunched up in the middle of the canvas. Then there's a group titled M Flare, which at this point only has the two lights that cross over in it. Obviously, the name isn't a complete coincidence. <laughs> and lastly, the group containing the text object. Now to add our flare, which in Final Cut Pro 10 is an effect, but in Motion, it's a generator. So we simply go into the Library tab and then click the third category down, Generators. Here, next to the standard generator themes and any other third-party ones you may have installed, you'll find a folder for Motion VFX. Once selected, we see the MFLARE 2 generator under the library window. Now I just make sure I'm at the beginning of my project timeline and can simply click and drag it from here to my project pane somewhere into the gray area and release the mouse. And if this is the first time you're using MFLARE 2 in motion, you get a big MFLARE 2 first steps window. Clicking on the right arrow at the bottom then takes you through three hints that are essential to getting the most out of MFLARE here in motion. The first telling me about controls, the next about blend modes, and a third about lights in a group. All three of which we're of course going to talk about now, so I can simply decide whether I want to see the message every time I use MFLARE or never again, and click OK. With that, I'm back in the canvas with my new group with my flare generator in it. The first thing that becomes apparent is that the image I'm seeing isn't exactly all that exciting. My type is completely gone, and the default flare is just barely visible. At the same time, even though the flare generator is selected, as opposed to what we're used to in Final Cut Pro 10, when the effect is selected in the inspector, I don't see any on-screen controls whatsoever. Both of these are quickly and easily remedied. Again, they're not shortcomings of MFLARE, but rather due to the programming restrictions that Motion has via its plugin APIs, as they're called. To actually get to see my flare at its full potential and my type, I merely need to change a couple of settings. First off, because my scene is both in 3D and I have lights in my scene, and objects are set to take these into consideration or inherit their light by default, my flare generator is throwing me some shade, if you will. I just need to select the flare and go into its properties by hitting F1, which switches me to the inspector tab and the properties. Here, if I simply scroll down to its lighting parameters and flip them open if needed, and in the shading menu, I just need to switch them from inherited to off. This, by the way, is at least part of what the third hint at the beginning was trying to tell me. And voila, my flare is fully visible. But it's still covering my type because it doesn't have any transparency by default either. Again, the limitations. No big deal, all we need to do is change its blend mode. That we can do any number of ways, either here in the Properties tab, since I'm already here, or I can just simply right-click the layer in the Layers list, or even in the Canvas and scroll down to Blend Mode, and choose either Add or the Screen Blend Mode. This being the second hint at the beginning. And magically, my type reappears. Okay, that's settled. But what happened to the cool on-screen controls that I had in Final Cut Pro 10? Well, those two need to be activated first. 
If the flare is selected, all I have to do is right click it in the canvas and select control in the pop-up menu. Alternatively, I could just as well select the adjust item tool in the tool menu under the canvas. And this being the first hint we got at the beginning in the big old hint window. So those are the three hints. And with that, I also get the on-screen controls that we know from Final Cut Pro 10. We've got the source position and brightness control when we mouse over the flare. We have the center control in the middle. And we have the floating panel at the bottom left with the edit presets and tracker buttons. Perfect. Unfortunately, if you deselect and reselect the flare, you have to invoke the on-screen controls again via the right click or tools menu, but oh well. To get to all the other controls we're now familiar with, we simply need to hit F4 to get to the Generator Settings tab, or manually just navigate our way there through the Inspector tabs. And if you have the HUD active with F7, you get a selection of the most relevant settings and parameters here also. But I'm going to use the Inspector for the full set. Here we see all the parameters that we already got to know in Final Cut Pro 10, which all of course pretty much work the same way in motion. So what about my animation? Well, I have a couple of options. I could, of course, simply keyframe the flare animation to follow my existing light animation to give them a volumetric look. The exact same way we did it in Final Cut at first also. We just need to go into the inspector, scroll down and flip open position, where we see the source set to manual. With that, we just need to keyframe the points parameters as needed. But aside from being tedious, <laughs> needing two flare generators with individual animations for each light, it's also a very imprecise science. Especially if the animation were any more complex, the likelihood of a perfect match would be very slim. But hey, we have a built-in tracker, right? So why not use that? If I click the tracker button on my floating panel, we can see that under position, two things happen. One is the same as in Final Cut, namely that the source setting automatically switches to the Mocha tracker. But what's different is that we get this drop or image well below it. That's because in Final Cut, M-Flare is an effect. So it's pretty obvious you want to track something in the clip that it's applied to. But since it's a generator here in motion, and the flare tracking itself would be pretty pointless, we get this image well so we can drag and drop whatever layer it is we want to be tracking from the layers list into the well. So I'll just drag one of the two animated lights from the M-Flare group into the well. But with the light over the well, I'm not getting the usual hooked arrow that I should be getting, telling me that it's about to be added as the track source. Dropping it also does nothing. That's because a light can't be tracked, since it's not in fact an image. It's virtual, therefore there's really nothing to track. So am I left with doing it manually after all? Nope because there's a third option, and one that only works here in motion. Returning to the source position parameter in the inspector, if we click on the pop-up menu that says Mocha Tracker on it, we can see that this is where we could switch back to the first mode, Manual, or we can switch to the third mode, Lights in Group. This being the other part of the third hint in the beginning, by the way. And as clearly stated, this is a motion-only feature. For lack of any lights in Final Cut, I don't see how it could work anyway. So now I just simply select it and nothing happens. In fact, if I go back to the canvas and mouse over the flare, I don't even have a position control anymore. Just the brightness slider and scale ring. And that's because it's the lights in group mode and the group the flare is in doesn't have any lights. So all I have to do is move the M flare generator into a group that has lights. Clearly my M flare group, drag and drop and bingo. Not only do both my lights now have a flare, but if I play everything back, they also follow my animation to the T. And I get as many flares as I have lights with just one instance of the generator. Brilliant. Now I just want to change the flares to something more interesting. So I'll just hit the presets button either in the on-screen panel or the one in the inspector. And here maybe go for LED diode and close that up. Ah, how wonderfully JJ. <laughs> Obviously, I have the same issue of the flares already being there from the very beginning, since the lights themselves are too. But that also leads me to the last couple of settings I quickly want to point out that are both unique and helpful. 
one of which also brings a little bit of a gotcha with it. First, referencing the light's keyframes in the timeline, I'll just set the in and out points of my mflare group to where the animation starts and ends with the I and O keys. Now I'd like a short fade and not just a popping in and out. And this I can do in various ways. Probably the easiest would be to add a simple fade in out behavior to the group or manually keyframe its opacity. But even though that would actually work, that's by far the least realistic looking. Actually reducing the flare's intensity would be your best bet. And for this, there are two options. The first would be to select the M flare generator and again, as we did once before in Final Cut, keyframe the brightness of the flare, or in this case, flares, over time as needed. This is of course the best looking and one of the easiest. But with that, we're animating the brightness of all the lights in the group simultaneously. So if we wanted to adjust them individually for an animation or whatever, we'd have to make separate groups and separate flares. Or we used the third option. We simply adjust the brightness of the actual lights. But if I select one of my lights and adjust its intensity, we can see that that really only affects the reflections of the light on our type, but not the flare. But if we go back to the mflare generator settings in the inspector and scroll down to the source position parameters, we see a checkbox under the mode menu that says use light intensity. All I have to do is activate this and from here on out, the flare's intensity follows the intensity settings of each light individually. Again, meaning I could also keyframe, therefore animate each light's intensity as well if needed. Very helpful. But I have one more thing. I just want to point to a small gotcha, at least specifically in a case like this. Should anyone get the idea to make something similar and think, hey, this would be great with brightness tracking too, which is actually totally true. Only in motion, it's not just a simple matter of activating it. There are a few hoops to jump through, again, due to the differences how things work under the hood. If you're working with a full screen clip, as we were in Final Cut Pro, then only the next first couple of steps are relevant to getting it working. So basically, I just want to use my title as the mat or mask, if you will, for my brightness tracking. I select my flare generator, go to the inspector, and flip open the animation section and then the track brightness, as we've already seen in Final Cut, and click the on off checkbox. If I scroll a little further, we see here again, there is one major difference compared to Final Cut's options. Again, since this is a generator and not an effect, in other words, there is no underlying image to the flare for reference, Motion is basically asking us which layer we want, since it can't use itself. Okay, so I'll just drag my text layer from the layers pane into the well. And more or less as expected, my flare disappears. And if I were now working with a regular full screen video, as in Final Cut, my work would end here. But if I scroll back and forth, I can see an occasional flickering of my flare, but the little reflection in the type tells me that while the light is over the text in some places, it's not showing. Why is that? Well, if we select the type layer, we can see by its bounding box that it's of course only a fraction the size of the whole frame. But mflare, again, due to certain restrictions under the hood, has to assume that this is a full frame image and treats it that way. To see exactly what this means in the context of the brightness mat, we simply need to turn on the preview. For that, we need to go back to our mflare generator layer and first turn on the on-screen overlays with a right click. Otherwise, we won't see the brightness mat when we turn it on. With that, we can go back to the track brightness settings in the inspector and here activate the preview. We get the black and white mat that Motion is using and it's pretty clear something is far from right. What's happening is actually pretty simple. Any layer I drop on the well, it assumes, or rather has to assume, is a full-sized canvas filling image. So the size of my project, which it would be if it were just a regular clip. But in a case like this, Mflare is taking what I gave it and making it full screen, which is what I'm seeing a completely stretched and distorted image of my type layer. One that obviously has very little to do with the original. So what do I do? Well, 
I need to somehow get a flat and full screen version of my type layer to give to motion as a correct reference. And since that needs to be a 2D layer, as we'll see in a second, I can't actually use the original text layer since switching it to 2D would mess up my animation, lighting interaction, and whatnot else. So first thing, I simply select my text layer and hit the K key to clone it. I could of course simply duplicate it, but then any changes I happen to make to the original animation wouldn't be reflected in the duplicate. And since the clone isn't receiving any lights and is on top of the original, it seems to disappear. So I can either choose a blend mode such as add or screen if I want to leave it where it is, or simply put it behind the original, or both. But we can see by its bounding box that the clone has the exact same size as the original, so the result would be the same. To make it full screen, we need to set its group to fixed resolution. But a 3D group can't have a fixed resolution, and if we switch its current group to 2D, we switch the original animations to 2D also and have the same issues we're trying to avoid. So we simply put the clone in its own group. For that, I just right click on it and select group from the context menu. Now I can switch just this group to 2D within the original 3D group. The moment I do this, the fixed resolution option appears in the inspector under the group tab. After Effects users will know this as the continuous rasterize setting, by the way. Check the box and we see its bounding box is now the same size as our canvas, meaning it's being rasterized at full frame. All we need to do now is go back to our flare settings, scroll to the track brightness image well once again, and now drag the group with our clone onto it. Right clicking on the canvas and selecting control gives me my screen controls back. And now if I activate the preview option in the track brightness section, we see that we have a perfectly fitting brightness mat. All I need now is to maybe lower the threshold and adjust the softness a bit to get more white sections along the path of the lights, since white determines where the flare will show. Turn off the preview and play it back. Nice. Now with just a little more tweaking here and there and maybe some fades on the lights, I'd have me a great looking animation complete with auto animating flares. Well, that does it for me and this tutorial series. I hope you could learn something useful. And if I spiked your interest in mFlare version two, be sure to check out the description for further infos. This is Robin Kerr signing off. Thanks for watching and take care.